Today, I'm speaking to Professor Sharon Lewin, who is director of the Peter Doherty Institute for Infection and Immunity in Melbourne, Australia. Uh, Sharon, thank you so much for joining us. Pleasure to be here, Rowena. So you work in Australia, and I think um, you have some very different experiences in Australia with this coronavirus. Can you give us an update on what the COVID situation looks like down under, so to speak? Uh, sure. So at the moment, uh, now on April the 10th, um, there's just over 5,000 cases of COVID-19, about 50 deaths, and numbers of new infections are decreasing quite significantly. We peaked at on about the 27th of March, and now the numbers of new infections are declining in every state. So we've been testing a lot, and we've done 330,000 tests, which I think is just a bit less than the whole US, which is pretty incredible given we're only 25 million people. Yeah, well, that really is amazing. Um, definitely enviable numbers uh, for those of us in the Northern Hemisphere or those of us in New York. Um, and speaking of that, you know, of course, we are looking for any ray of hope. And I know a lot of people are pinning their hopes on the idea that this virus might be seasonal. Unfortunately, we had a report come out in the United States just a few days ago that, you know, we shouldn't really count on that. So where do you come down on that? Do you think any part of this um, better experience so far with coronavirus in Australia might have to do with the fact that you guys are just coming out of summer now? You know, I don't know the answer to that. Um, prior to 27th of March, the numbers of new infections were increasing exponentially. There was no hint that the increase, the rate of increase, the doubling rate, which at that time I think was doubling every two days, there's no hint that that doubling rate's any different to what's been observed in Europe, China, the US. But what led to the reduction was of course all the social distancing measures, high rates of testing, isolation, quarantine, the usual things that we know work and work so well in China. So the doubling rate here was the same. And then of course there's this data on enveloped virus being sensitive to temperature and humidity and sunlight. And I haven't seen anything to show that that's the case with SARS-CoV-2. So I don't know, um, I don't know the answer to that, other than we were certainly seeing similar doubling rates to the rest of the world. I understand that your team isolated um, virus from the first patient who was diagnosed with coronavirus in Australia. And furthermore, that, you know, in the spirit of collaboration, you shared um, information about that virus with the rest of the world. And I think what we're seeing is um, really remarkable scientific collaboration with this uh, coronavirus, that even to a greater extent than what we've seen before. What would your comments be on that? Uh, yeah, I agree with that. Um, remarkable sharing through pre-print um, servers. Uh, on January the 24th, um, our first case in Australia was diagnosed. It was a woman that had come back from Wuhan. And um, our team, led by Mike Catton, had the test ready to go um, and diagnosed that the person was PCR positive and then rapidly tried to isolate the virus, knowing that other people had found it difficult. Anyway, Mike had already decided he was going to share it far and wide. And we did. You are normally an immunologist, and I know your group has worked on characterizing the immune response to this coronavirus. Have you found anything unusual or mm -hmm. noteworthy that kind of surprised you? Well, I, the, the study that we did was on about this fourth patient, I think, that had come in, was diagnosed in Victoria. Um, we happened to have a pre-approved protocol mm -hmm. and allowed us to basically track what the immune response was um it probably wasn't very surprising a lot of activated t cells high expression of pd1 um a very rapid expansion of plasma blasts which are cells that produce antibodies and that those cells persisted well at at the time of symptomatic recovery it sparked a whole lot of new um ideas about uh what we should be looking for to predict severe disease, what we should be looking for to predict recovery, how you can use and those plasma blasts, which are now being isolated to generate antibodies. So it sort of spawned a lot of research. And I guess we would, we would, we, to be honest, we were pretty lucky that because we had done that um, enough, that all, the virologists were all over SARS-CoV-2 at the time. There was nothing out there on the immunology, but obviously we're gonna learn a lot more 
and that cohort's now significantly expanded. So we'll mm. get an insight into severe and mild disease. There is, um, you know, this issue that I think a lot of people are poised and ready to start learning some um, badly needed lessons uh, on coronavirus. You know, a lot of I think a lot of HIV researchers are turning to see how they can use their expertise. Are you seeing a lot of HIV researchers do that and, and to good effect? I am. In fact, all around the world, um, that seems to be happening for a number of reasons. Um, a lot of HIV researchers, well, their infectious disease physicians or their virologists or the immunologists, so all that experience is really relevant. And I've since subsequently seen lots and lots of um, HIV scientists uh, onto this, and I think we've got a lot to offer. Yeah, for sure. Um, Sharon, uh, I want to thank you very much for your time. Um, we've learned a lot of interesting things that we didn't necessarily know about what's going on there in Australia. Wish you all the best. Hope you find uh, some, some great new information that we can put to use and put an end to this pandemic. Thanks for spending time. Thanks, Rowena. And all the best to you too, especially in New York City. Thinking of Thanks. you all.